Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to start the seminar. Um, so for those of you who are new, my name is Charles Small. I'm the director of ISGAP, and it's an honor to have with us Dr. Ellie uh, Vinacor. Ellie is from the Gordon College of Education and the School of Tourism at the University of Haifa. Um, before I introduce Ellie, I just want to say that next week we have our, our seminars, two important seminars. We'll have Natan Sharansky on Monday, June 3rd, in, uh, 11 a.m. New York. And then on Wednesday, we have Arnon Gross and David Bodin, and they're doing work on UNRWA and uh, anti Semitism in school books. It's a very important uh, project that they've been doing for years. And the Tan Sharansky is Monday. So the Vinacor is a, a scholar at the University of Haifa and the Gordon College of Education. He's the head of the Department of Informal and Community ed Education at Gordon College in Haifa, where he trains the next generation of Israel's educators. Uh, additionally, Eli is the director of the practical track for the Countering Contemporary Antisemitism program, and the de he deals with the delegitimization of Israel at the School of Tourism at the University of Haifa. Eli is the founder and, and one of the key master's program that focuses on the interdisciplinary aspects of contemporary antisemitism and it's at the Department of Israel Studies at the University of Haifa. It's a very important program. Today, Eli, who he joined us uh, in our Oxford program last summer in, uh, at uh, St. At St. John's College, he participated and he brought colleagues uh, with, with him to our program. Today, Eli is going to be speaking about social justice, human rights, cosmopolitanism, and enemies, Jewishness, and the Jewish state. So Ellie, welcome and thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Charles, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, I want to congratulate you for the remarkable work you're doing in our, um, um, it's humbling to be a guest. What I'll try to briefly speak about in the next uh, 10 minutes, a bit more maybe or less, we'll see, and then we'll uh, take some questions and see where it goes, is an attempt to suggest a framing and to a unique moment, I believe, that we're facing, where uh, anti-Semitism has reshaped once again. And in addition to the amalgam of hate that it already includes, a new form of anti-Semitism has uh, joined the game, which I will try to frame. Um, um, I realized I'll be walking on a tightrope between the, the theological, the philosophical, and the psychological frameworks, trying to seek for a new understanding of the nature and the source of Jew hate today. First of all, the facts. We all know them, we all see them, we experience them today, especially today with the new tide of anti-Semitism related to the coronavirus. Uh, I saw that you'll have uh, Dina, Professor Dina Porat on board in uh, almost two weeks. I think she will elaborate much more about that. But if we look at what is happening in recent years, we can see that even from, even from, from, from the data, surveys conducted by, for example, the Anti-Defamation League published a year ago showed that one in four Europeans holds anti-Semitic views. Another survey conducted by the Claims Conference exposed that a third of Americans do not believe that six million Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. According to data published by the FBI in 2018, 57.8% of crimes on religious basis during that year were committed against Jews, which is four times more than against Muslims despite the Jews being only 2.3% of the general population in the US. Already a decade ago, the French sociologist Pierre-André Tagaif warned of the creation of a new phenomena, opposite to any common logic, and described it as a contemporary tricolor, uh, consisted of brown, red, and green, representing three different strides of hatred towards the Jews and their state. Brown, the neo-fascist brown, the Muslim green, 
and the Marxist and anti-globalist red. We see those tides. We see how the far right, the racist and anti-Semitic movements are growing and gaining polit political strength. And even though for now they are aiming, aiming only to take care of the immigrants, we know that the Jews will be next. And uh, in the fundamental circles, we see a new, a, a new tide of Christian and Islamic anti-Semitism conspiracy theories um, originating from these two groups about Jewish domination over Washington, classic blood labels, now the coronavirus and different calls to harm Jews are widespread on the internet. But what I wanna place emphasis upon today is that there's something new that we should introduce to our attempt to understand something that is almost impossible to understand, that longest hatred um, as uh, Professor Wistrich called it, towards Jews. And what happens today, I believe, is that precisely those people who fight for the freedom, the justice, the equality, uh, and against racism and ignorance are those who seek or dig under the foundations of Israel's right to exist. In the eyes of those sometimes called progressives or even new progressives, Jews are no longer the other of Western civilization, as they were during, for example, the Holocaust or through millennia. Judaism now becomes the innate evil within that Western civilization and all that it's brought about, because we're living in a unique moment, in a moment where after the Enlightenment killed God and was not able to bring about a better world, the intellectual today looks at the world and has three big options. One is to disappear within the postmodern um, pleasure machine, which might be, again, in drugs or uh, alcohol or work day in and day out, 24 seven. But this is something an intellectual cannot agree to. He does not want to disappear inside the nothingness, inside the always the same. The other option is the jihad, which offers a pretty clear direction and understanding of the world, and as a result, hatred towards the Jews. But there's another third aspect that emerges today. To some extent, we can say that an intellectual who is looking profoundly in the mirror today and tries to understand the reason for all the wrongdoings of, the, of Western civilization in recent decades, sees once digging deep enough that there's a deep source for all that evil. Because looking in the mirror and seeing how evil I am does not bring me anywhere closer to a justification of life today. Why should I wake up tomorrow in the morning? How can I find a reason to exist for an intellectual today in that post-metaphysic world to justify one's existence? It is a true challenge. And there are two options. Because when I look at the mirror, I see that the innate source of most evil today is what the Jewish, the Judo-Christian, perspective brought to the Western society. Because if you look deep enough, you can read in some of the texts, which I will quote in a sec, the consonation, the imperialism and colonialism of the United States and Western Europe, they all stem from these ideas of the chosen people and hierarchy. Inequality, injustice and social repression also stem from the Jewish desire towards elevation. In a cosmopolitan world where there's no narrative that's worthier than another. There's no room for a chosen people or for a country that defines itself as Jewish. Alan Badiou, one of the most celebrated philosophers of our times has written in utter seriousness that the Jewish state is a barrier towards world peace. Silvoy Zizak, a philosophical rock star in and of himself claimed that the problem with those historical monsters that murdered millions was in fact that they weren't violent enough. Thus, 
writes Gurzev, what we're facing today is not a political dispute. We're facing two agendas with more or less the same attempt to solve the problem. One agenda, the postmodern one, is unable to agree with the existence of these ideas because there is no idea, there is no narrative that is greater, more important, more viable than another narrative. And the other agenda that does not agree to this is trying to find meaning in the struggle, trying to find meaning in the fight for those who were hurt by this Western civilization as a means to justify one's waking up in tomorrow's morning. It is not a political dispute, writes Gulzev, but rather it's a mental, it's a spiritual need. In a postmodern world, it has no higher instantions. There's nowhere towards whom a new progressive can lay claims before and somehow repent for his culture's sins. Moreover, in light of his refusal to join to the capitalistic rush towards momentary satisfaction, how will he summon one's inspiration to wake up, to justify one's existence? Sometimes by joining the project of sacrificing the state of Israel on the altar of the freedom of, from oppression as a channel to give meaning to his life. Thus, it is a true challenge. In a world where, to use the words of popular Democratic Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, there is a lot of people more concerned about being precise, factually, semantically correct than being morally right. How long can we be disappointed from the fact that these who are called new progressives are dismissive regarding facts presented by people who are trying to explain Israel? What they're looking for are not facts. Their inner surge, claims Gulzev, is not rational. It is much deeper. And this, I believe, creates an enormous challenge. An enormous challenge because on the public realm, there is a need to wake up and understand that we're facing an ideological challenge on a global scale, on a national scale. It's not only if we will be able to explain the facts properly, then we will be able to convince someone that we're right and they're wrong and we'll give it another try and then we'll give it another try. And on the other side, there's someone who for some reason is sometimes, not always, but sometimes not even prone to listen to the logical explanation. And on the educational realm, there's a need to understand that it is not enough to teach only about the past which is very important and is the reason why we're here. But there are also contemporary ideological challenges that our country and that world Jewry is facing. As uh, Professor David Patterson wrote, anti, the anti-Semite is drawn by an urge to eliminate that godly point of love and grace that Judaism brought to the world. He cannot live with that. In this sense, and in this sense, looking at all these different hatreds that are culminating around Israel and the idea of Jewishness today, we can say that in some sense, writes Gulzev, precisely because of this hatred, the people of Israel are chosen once again. The subversion aimed at their right to exist on the one hand and the emptiness of... <laughs> Of the, West, of, 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 the, of, of the rest of these solutions, on the other hand, are, com are compiling us today to educate in light of those values. To some extent, we can say that the reality that is pushing us, the reality is pushing us today to understand that we need to look introspectively inside ourselves. The fact that the anti-Semite has a problem, it's his problem. But we as a society, do we live those life, this life that we aim towards, the life upon which we were created as a nation, the life we want us to have as a congregation, as a community, as a global community? So to some extent, it's an opportunity also for us to understand that it's not only to say that we're right and they're wrong, end of story. There's also an opportunity for an awakening and a societal change, an educational change in the way we perceive ourselves, 
live our lives, justify our lives, and make our lives worthy of living, and thus, by this showing and giving a proof of our right to exist. I don't know if I was clear enough, and, but maybe through the questions we'll be able to somehow elaborate. Okay, so, so Eli, thank you very much. It's uh, thought-provoking. I was about to say, where's the hope? But your last line, you gave, you gave the hope. So I, and I think Israel, you know, Atikva, and I think Israel's existence is ultimately the hope. It's a vibrant, amazing society with problems and contradictions for sure, but it's so vibrant and innovative and uh, alive culturally, musically, in terms of food, uh, high tech, education, the media. It's a vibrant, alive place with people, you know, returning literally from all parts of the world to create a, 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 the mo one of the most amazing societies perhaps known historically. So there is that profound hope. Yeah. And I think Israel is the answer to this uh, emptiness. As you, as you I, rem I remember speaking to Professor Wistrick a few weeks before he passed away. And this was exactly the conversation we had about the, paradoxically speaking, um, as hard as it gets today, there's really a true opportunity to really resurrect these sublime ideas and instill them inside a beautiful society already that has its challenges. But if we'll be able to transcend them and build that worthy society, then again, paradoxically speaking, these challenges will promote us to develop once more, just like it happened in the past. So, so in a sense, I don't want to get too uh, esoteric or uh, biblical, but so Israel is really becoming a light onto nations in the sense that before COVID-19, we were living in a in so the age of globalization where I think marginalization uh, was expanding, socioeconomic political marginalization was expanding. Uh, people were getting kind of stuck in time and space. States were failing. You had the implosion of... Uh, East African and Middle Eastern societies, refugee problems, migration problems. So now with this, uh, in the last few months with this sort of economic uh, shutdown, which is unparalleled, yeah. I, I would argue, and I, I think you'd agree that these cleavages that we're developing are being exacerbated in a very profound way. So how do you see the role of anti-Semitism? You spoke about Tagiev's book, the, the Brown, the Red and the Green. So, so these extreme social movements, these reactionary social movements that are all using anti-Semitism as part of a key element of the ideology. How do you see the threat to, to the Jewish people, to Israel, and to democratic principles over the next uh, short period of time? What do you, what, what do you think? I think it's a, it's a threat to everyone. It's a threat to the West at its best. Uh, that is the struggling for the salvation for its soul by sacrificing its spirit to some extent in this uh, surge against uh, Israel. And I think there's, a, there's an educational opportunity here because nothing fruitful can be built out of hate. This is one of the biggest lessons I think we can learn from what happened to Marxism and its procreations and to critical theory and everything. It's built on hate, marking those who should be hated and then surging against them. But nothing fruitful can be built out of that. I think the opportunity now is to suggest an alternative. This is why, to some extent, Jewishness and the Jewish state who have an opportunity to exemplify being the other, a true, a different relation towards other, others and otherness like being hated or being labeled or being attacked does not have to put you in a state of, a sec of, of, a, of an oppressed, but rather can forge the birth of a new ideological, uh, to some extent, maybe attempt to answer this challenge, which is again, to try to show that a society, an ideology, life could be built out of love, not out of hate. This is the strongest answer I think we can suggest today to these situations. And what happens today in the world is a very, very good opportunity because the whole world is in some kind of a halt now due to the situation. So some people are using this frustration um, 
to magnify hatred. But on the other hand, it also grows the opportunity to think differently about the, the way the civilization has to develop, not only in this egocentric, one-way, profit-oriented direction, but rather on a different, maybe more social, more loving, more compassionate society that has to be built as a result of these lessons learned. And here, I think, this could be a true startup for the startup nation. Interesting. So we have a question from Trisha Roth, and she poses a question that I was also thinking about what, what you raised. And she asked, so how, how do we communicate with or try to, to fend off and, and defend against anti-Semitism with people who feel so, so self-righteous in their cause that they will not listen? They're not interested in debate. They're not interested in uh, virtue signaling. So how do you cope with, uh, yeah. with, with this reality? And, and, and the two of us come from academia and, and you know, and I think the, the academic yeah. brain where ideas and debate is supposed to take place, those of us who are studying or dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism are often categorized and dismissed. So how, yeah. do, how, do, you, yeah. how do you address Trisha's uh, important question? I think it's a very important question. I think it's... Uh... It's, it's hard to ask to, 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 to even explain how important that is, how difficult it is. And to some extent, there's a, again, th this question is rising every time we speak about these issues. Whether there, if we're talking about those people who are not prone to listen, I had a colleague, I have a colleague who once was invited to a prestigious conference in London to a seminar, to a workshop. And all the colleagues sent their papers in advance. And it was about marketing countries in crisis and marketing in general. And most of the papers were against Israel. So my colleague looked at the papers and saw that they were empirically wrong. Like the basic empirical, the experiment, the assumptions, the facts, all over the place. So he tried answering people and trying to challenge them and to nicely... Um, make them rethink what they wrote and got no answers. Came to that seminar and was bombarded with pure hate. And he, re he returned very frustrated. To some extent, sometimes it is a waste of our energy. What sometimes uh, this uh, challenge has to make us do, I think, is rethink ourselves, is to check once again our set of morals, our behavior, our writing, our education, improve it as much as we can, and speak to those who are prone to listen. Because you will, because as I said before, it's not only an intellectual debate. It is much deeper than that. And we need to try to see if we can suggest an alternative that is as deep as that. And to some extent show it to others, to the world, in our behavior, in our life, in our communities. And this will be our answer. This was always our answer. Well, so, so where do we draw, where do we create the, uh, the big institute on the study of contemporary anti-Semitism? Do we do it in Galut? I'm in <laughs> Oxford, or do we come to Israel and we sit and we discuss as uh, free citizens of a Jewish state? We need both. We need both. Our biggest problem is also the separation between world Jewry. I spoke to so many Jews abroad and the things that they're interested with, the things that are, prevent them from sleep um, are, for example, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You speak to Israelis, they couldn't care less. Not because it's not important, because it's not on the agenda. We just had four elections. No one even spoke in his no party, not even nowhere to be found. And I'm saying, I'm talking about the Jewish parties and, not, and also not only the Jewish party. No one spoke about normalization, about it's, it's something that does not bother the Israeli. There is such a huge gap between us as Jews that has to be bridged first. So these institutions have to be established in both places, I think. And I think that you are doing a great job by trying to network yourself as much as you can because it's, it's our problem. It's our challenge. It should unite us. In general, we have this capacity. Unfortunately, this is the only capacity that unites us today. When there's trouble, when there's a threat, then as a pile of nuts, we gather again together in the same sack and we meet one another. And when the threat is somehow, and somehow decreases, we 
return to our own places and live our own lives. The challenge today, I think, is how to build these um, institutes all over the world where people can sit and speak freely and try to create an alternative in the way they live, in the way they educate, in the way they research, in the way they present the facts. And you're a great example of that. It's critical anti-Semitism. It's not just speaking the plain, I'm right, you're wrong. It is trying to understand this phenomenon from various perspectives, with different scholars, having different opinions, but still aiming to find that mutual humane ground that is sometimes so missing in these surges against uh, Jewishness and in the general uh, debate over racism. Yeah. Uh, the work you and your colleagues are doing is very important. There's many questions kind of coming through. And I'll just say, in terms of the rising anti-Semitism, uh, my parents' home in Florida was desecrated a few days ago with swastika. Oh my God. So, and, and I think this is going to be coming more commonplace. Uh, very disturbing, very cowardly and disturbing. Yeah. Um, there's a question from somebody who's anonymous. How can we mend Jewish uh, sort of self-hatred and the internalization of anti-Semitism? Good question. <laughs> Very good questions. To just, I'll, I'll, I'll give a small uh, remark about education. Um, I think, I'm not talking about myself as a good educator, but in general, a good educational process is a process that can spring questions. And sometimes questions are more important than answers. Just to have them around, to debate, to think about them together, to try to build that mutual and congregation of people who think maybe differently, but can think together. The biggest challenge I see in this idea of safe hatred is that self-hatred is that it's, again, it, it does not build, it ruins. Instead of being uh, Lot's wife and looking back on the city that is uh, destructed, we need to look forward towards tikkun olam, towards what we can contribute. So it is correct that no one, no human being is perfect and we have our sins, we've made our sins. But the constant um, attempt to dig in them does not give birth, it uh, rottens. Thank you. So, and there's another question now from Yuval Gavish, and he asks, how, how come that Jews, Jews as a category escape this whole discussion around intersectionality and intersectionality activism? Why, why Jews uh, can't enjoy their chatel? Chat, chat, I, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's an important... Uh, it's an important remark. I'll, I'll, I'll just use it as a remark because it's another proof of the irrationality of uh, the phenomenon we're discussing. It's, it's really unbelievable. Like every minority has its right in uh, this discussion besides one that is considered to be uh, the suddenly, for some reason, with, with no historical background, the white, uh, privileged, uh, medium class and more, whereas Jews suffered even more than everyone else. It's in general a very interesting situation we're facing today, um, where those who were really treated with injustice, once gaining power, which is important, once receiving the ability to actually finally voice themselves, are sometimes using this voice to silence others. This is the irony of our times. And uh, it is troubling, it is sad, it is immoral. And uh, again, it is not building a society, it is ruining it. They're digging eventually under their own right to exist because it will eventually flip. Again, life could not be built upon hate, upon immoral um, speech. Yeah, it's extraordinary. We, we were exterminated because we were white in a short period of time. The children of the thinkers and executioners of the Holocaust are now telling us that we're not white yeah. and we're part of the problem. It's, 
Yeah. Douglas Murray write, wrote about it in his recent book, I think, also. Really? Uh, Interesting. Um, there's a good question from Max Horder. He asks, um, I want to ask a, a similar question to Dr. Vinokur that Leo Strauss rhetorically asked in his famous uh, 1962 essay, why do we remain Jews? Yeah, <laughs> I, I love the questions. I would just, you know, there's um, when I've been a, a visiting scholar at Columbia University, there's uh, at the end of every seminar, they have this, uh, at least in the teacher's college, they have this section of like 10 minutes where people just ask questions and you cannot answer and they stay in the air. So these questions are, I would love us all to uh, contemplate uh, on this question. It's a profound question. Yeah. It's a question I'm asking myself every morning. It's a profound question. The easy answer is because we have no choice and history has proven us that as much as Jews tried to escape or to assimilate or to disappear, eventually it returned to them from ancient times where they tried to hide their circumcision through Bordeaux when they tried to learn general knowledge instead of the Talmud and in Germany when, when they tried to push the country towards uh, financial success after for World War I and then Spain allowing the the ships of Columbus, whomever was there, to go to their trips and eventually the same uh, to their conquests and eventually the same uh, king and queen were the ones who signed the expulsion of the Jews. It's something, and in communist Russia, there's endless examples of the fact that reality proves Jews that they have no chance but to eventually remain Jews. The biggest question is whether it stays there whether this is the only answer we can give ourselves. And if this is the case, we're in trouble. We're in severe trouble. And we don't need to give ourselves religious answers. We need to give ourselves humane answers, but answers that will justify, that will allow us to justify our existence as a unique nation, just like every nation has the right to exist. What do we bring to ourselves and to the world? What are those, the positive message we bring? And I think that eventually this is the true essence of Judaism as explained by Rabbi Nachman from Breslev and as explained by, by Rabbi Akiva and by all those thinkers that eventually forged our culture is love thy friend as thyself. It is, it, it's a novel ideal. Maybe it's even unreachable, but the striving towards that and building your life in this light is being a Jew, at least to me. And that's at least how I'm trying to educate. As you're speaking, I'm thinking like, you know, we, you and I deal with anti-Semitism, which is, I guess, the world of lies and, uh, yeah. and, and, and uh, filth, uh, immorality. But I, I also learn a bit with uh, Akiva, Rabbi Akiva Zweig, who you met in, yeah, in Oxford, yeah. we do now as we're Zooming as everybody. And it's amazing. You can spend, uh, you know, weeks on a paragraph, on a few sentences. The wisdom that we have inherited is extraordinary, even, even not even if you're not so religious, just the, the depth of knowledge and wisdom that uh, we've been uh, blessed with is extraordinary. You know, I've, I've, I've wrote, uh, actually my PhD on uh, rooted cosmopolitanism, on the ability to draw cosmopolitan values from your own culture, mm -hmm. from the Islam, from Christianity and from Judaism. I was focusing on Judaism because this is my culture, but this is, to some extent, a suggestion. Like you don't have to, and, and the culture itself, at least the Jewish one, does not ask the congregation, at least now, to, to close itself within its barriers, but rather to strive towards tikkun olam, towards the correction of the world. Not forcefully, but uh, lovingly. In the face of another, I can reveal myself and see where I have room yeah. for correction. It's a suggestion especially in today's world that is so strife with conflict, we have a startup. We have a startup that we need to take pride of instead of eating each other between congregations and, and uh, inside the country here. I'm, I'm in charge of the faculty of social education here. So this is a big challenge. In Israel, we don't have four tribes, like the president said. We have hundreds of tribes in each and every one of them. They're all beautiful and they have the potential to shine. 
but these bridges are what we have to focus on, not self-hatred, not trying to justify ourselves, not trying to show how beautiful we are to someone else. It is not our uniqueness. It is, uh, there are so many more better things we can do. In your research, what were some of the thinkers that inspired you the most in your, in your, in your work on cosmopolitanism? Uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, that's interesting. That's interesting because <laughs> some of them can be defined as anti-Semites. When, uh, when I spoke to Ilan when he was still alive, uh, he said, you know, the one you're talking about is, uh, has the, but, but thinking out loud, um, I liked, uh, I liked, I liked the thought of, uh, first of all, of course, uh, there's uh, Martha Nussbaum uh, and there's uh, Anthony Apaya mm -hmm. trying to talk about how you can, again, take from your culture those values and appreciate others in their own culture by understanding that your culture is important to you. And to some extent, Kimlika, to some extent, Kimlika with his recent turn to find cosmopolitanism within Canadian citizenship, for example. Um, and uh, also a very interesting, uh, I think, idea was, uh, was raised by uh, the German uh, sociologist Ulrich Beck, who was talking about the need to reinvent most of the concepts we're using today in uh, social sciences, that they are, are idle irrelevant, family, the world of work, love, anti-Semitism, and many, he didn't speak about anti-Semitism, but you can add that to the equation, are all in need of a new framing because the world has changed and these challenges have changed. And for the social sciences to not remain in the past, they have to reinvent themselves or the scholars have to reinvent themselves in their practice to be relevant to today's world. And this also, I think, uh, is relevant to what we're talking about. The, def the positive definition of the challenge. There's like a fear, which is clear and understandable when speaking about anti-Semitism. You always want to push it farther from yourself because the anti-Semite is to blame. It's not the Jew to blame, of course. But on the other hand, after saying that, after saying that the anti-Semite has a problem that they have to deal with, it's not my problem, it's their problem. What does it tell us about our culture? What positive change can we bring about as a response? This, these are, I think, uh, and here Ilan Gurzaev was a great uh, inspiration. Uh, and of course, uh, David Peterson who was a great inspiration. I have this on my shelf, uh, his great book, uh, Anti-Semitism and its Metaphysical Origins. They're great people there. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's funny, no, so the summer program we run in Oxford, I got the idea that I attended a program on racism and colonialism in 1989, when I was just started my PhD at Oxford, and a guy named Abebe Zagai ran it, and I helped him in exchange for uh, attending for free. So this is how we, we kind of modeled the summer program. And Anthony Apaya was there, and he had just written his book, uh, In My Father's House. And I asked him the question, I said, why did you name the book My Father's House and not My Father's Home? And he was like, he was, it, was, <laughs> it was a good question. It's, it's a great about, question for him. Yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Anyways, we have more questions. So Bob Fishman, who you know from, from the summer school, uh, he said, will, will you explain the popularity of Linda Sassor and AOC and Talib and Omar? Uh, note that targeting of Jewish members of Congress is, uh, is, is really not being challenged in a sense. So why, what, what's, what does this represent? Is this a trend? dangerous trend what do you think it is a dangerous trend it is a dangerous trend but again it plays again it's our biggest i think um, challenge is to bring up an alternative because what happens today is again sitting on those issues of trying to find a meaning in labeling them an explanation to everything that is wrong and the easiest way or the most dangerous way to do that and labeling others and trying to blame them. And they're riding a tide, those Congresswomen, that I think we should answer not only by preventing them from entering a country, but by trying to say, okay, this, we have a different alternative and we have a different um, explanation 
to the wrongdoings you're trying to blame or place upon us. And of course, that labeling people instead of labeling an idea is a problem. It's a problem uh, that is ancient as history. The biggest issue is not the individual, is that um, yearning out of which he or she acts. This is what has to be condemned or praised. Egotism or ethnocentrism or love of humanity or respect, this, this is what's important. It's not the person that has to be condemned. It is uh, the inclination. So Jeffrey Bernard uh, just wrote, he said he, he thinks it's cowardice on part of the Democratic uh, Party uh, to let these members get away with what they're doing. And so what, why is there a lack of uh, standing up? Because I think you know, when Joe Biden sort of, he said this racist or insensitive remark last week, it was major news. And yet this type of anti-Semitism is sort of becoming um, yeah. a permanent fixture of the left wing of the Democratic Party. And it remains, you know, and, and even uh, Bernie Sanders, a, a proud Jewish uh, major figure in the Democratic Party has Linda Sarsour as a yeah. an advisor. So wh yeah. why this acceptance of uh, contemporary anti-Semitism? Again, great, great question. Um, again, I think that the whole issue here is the inability to forge an, uh, a deeper answer because I can find an explanation and a satisfaction in protecting the rights and of those who were badly treated, of those who were uh, treated with injustice throughout history. And I can find satisfaction on a mental level. And you can see that. And in, in what happens today in the Democratic Party is, is very dangerous because um, I don't even want to think about what will happen. There's no alternative. That's the, our biggest problem. Not here, nor there, neither there. And what happens in the U.S. and I hope that in England it's it's it will improve after Corbyn's uh, defeat. Who knows? Still, it's deep within the party. The today's situation is very troubling. That's what that's that's what I can say. Like sometimes you do just don't have answers. You can you look at this and you see this tide. You see this wave rising and you can cover up or you can try to do as much as you can to build surfboards to be able to surf on it with your truth, hope, hoping that it will be strong enough in this battle of, uh, to some extent, good against evil. It's also, I think Abraham Lincoln said something to the effect, and I don't remember the exact quote, but what students study today in universities will become a uh, yeah. policy in the next generation. And I, I'm afraid, given the the mainstream demonization of who Jews are as a people, not just Israel and Zionism, but who we are as a people in the best universities in Europe and North America, North America is going to lead to more and more of a challenge because I think this is where we're training our leaders. And if you get a good education, you learn to see Israel in ways which you described eloquently in your presentation. So I think the unfortunately so are going to get more uh, serious. I remember speaking to um, one participant, I won't mention the name because I don't know if he'd like me to mention it, uh, who described his experience in one of the Ivy League institutions as a faculty member as something that the only solution to what he experienced there was early retirement, unfortunately. Because the feeling you have being there and to some extent, sometimes saying something that might be interpreted as supporting the state of Israel, or even the, it's, it's, uh, it's almost impossible, unbearable, yeah. unfortunately. And in this climate, it's the whole idea of hatred towards the state of Israel is not even a, a physical thing. It's an idea. It's an ideological threat. These, some, most of these people will never visit Israel and most of these claims are built upon ancient stereotypes that have, that have no grasp with reality, facts that are nothing but imagination and the good uh, option or deliberate lies in the worst one. Uh, 
but the whole thing is that this image that we're uh, that is being built around Israel today is an unbelievable challenge as you are saying we've lost the classrooms and this is uh, i don't this is i think it's it's one of the biggest challenges we're facing today and yeah. we woke up too late too late also yeah. in israel it's not easy it is not easy and even today in israeli schools no one speaks about those things even when a dispute is aroused in uh, between teachers they know very little about what's going on today they can have a dispute about the past, they can have a political dispute, but they don't know almost anything about the scope, the magnitude of these challenges and the way they're digging underneath the whole um, idea of Israel's right to exist. This is what is so troubling. We are in Gordon College and in, in the University of Haifa are thinking about establishing, at least in Gordon, uh, uh, an institution that will uh, be devoted to that with uh, the Catholic University uh, of Cato in uh, Cologne that will be devoted to that, to educating uh, educators, social workers, and uh, teachers in Israel and in Germany to, even before you talk about solutions, to understand the magnitude of the challenge because it is immense. Yeah, and I think our community and the diaspora, the Jewish community, the Jewish leadership, I don't think they, they don't pay attention to what's happening at the universities, what's happening in the intellectual world. In fact, I'd say most leaders of our community who are successful in business and in uh, policy and uh, leading our organizations and they do amazing work, but I think they often perceive uh, scholars and intellectuals as not being quite in the real world and, yeah. and, you know, and, and they don't pay attention to what you know, you're saying here and what other intellectuals are saying is that these problems in the classroom, we're losing another generation. And these young students today in the classroom that are being fed these uh, ideas that you're, you're discussing are going to be political leaders, they're going to be voters, they're going to be running businesses, large and small. And these citizens are going to, uh, they're being socialized yeah. with these, idea, with these and, ideas. And especially in today's generation where today's youth is so prone to, um, emo to be emotionally open and to be emotionally vulnerable, like those safe spaces in universities. Uh, sometimes when a lecturer might say something uncomfortable, they will burst into tears instead of debating or go to that safe space to come down. So when there is this sensitivity, it could become, unfortunately, it becomes sometimes um, an opportunity to utilize it against the state of Israel, to use this um, sensitivity to say that I can justify my being, my existing by joining to that struggle for those who were hurt the most and against the oppressors without even understanding nothing, n neither in history nor in contemporary politics. And that's a big challenge. So Eric Seidel writes, much of today's anti-Semitism is served up in college and universities classroom, often with the institution administration's tacit approval through their, through their non-action and even actions, I would say. How do we successfully yeah. deal with that? And then there's another question you know, what could be done with professors of Middle East studies and other subjects who teach their students that Israel and notions of Jewish people, it is not legitimate, it's colonizing and uh, irredeemable. I think you could answer this question <laughs> much better because that's what you're doing. This is the project. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create an alternative. Sometimes there's no point in trying to convince them or to show them the facts. There were attempts to teach together. I know I've heard of attempts of such in Australia, in the US, and mostly in most cases, the pro-Israeli side, which was usually not really pro-Israeli, but trying to be to somehow objective, was uh, found itself and in a minority to say the least. Yes. So um, to create different courses and a network of scholars who think differently and work together to create different courses, different institutions and uh, research centers, educate both uh, using the internet by creating um, data that is accessible to everyone to 
understand what's really going on and trying to, to and also I think there is a need to, 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 to grow an elite into intellectual uh, milieu that will try to challenge these opinions and it's hard it's very hard sometimes professors pay with their tenure and and this is uh, that's a problem yeah. also i think the whole the whole idea of facing the challenge has to bring together the actors that try to do something about it all the organizations and the academic endeavors we have to work together much more because our strength is in our unity otherwise we're we're weak in light of these tides that are um, an among, a mangalam of uh, financial interests political interests mental interests and uh, self justification and so forth mm. i agree i think we all we really need to work together and uh, yeah i mean I, and i think even even to do a project on people's uh, scholars experiences and how they've been marginalized or lost tenure or lost jobs uh, i think the vast majority and i can say this uh, with certainty the vast majority of scholars in europe and north america that have dealt with these issues in a serious manner their careers have been detrimentally yeah. affected and and not marginally affected but directly affected and it's um yeah it's a form of of uh, anti-Semitism and marginality and, and in all the professions where we're supposed to come to the table and debate and argue and discuss and learn from each other, there's a silencing. There's a silencing of uh, opinions that are looking at anti-Semitism in a critical way and it's very serious. Um, Heather O'Reilly thanks you for your wisdom. So she's running but she th thanks you for the uh, good seminar. Michael Kaplan uh, asks, the Jew is still perceived as the outsider, but now with Israel uh, as the global outsider. Strengthening diaspora Jewish, uh, strengthening diaspora Israel connection is the most important thing. What do you, what do you think about this? Um, regarding the otherness, it's, it's a mix. The challenge, it, it's much more complicated than just saying the Jewish are the, uh, the Jews are the other and are also the innate other, um, but again, um, because we're talking about this, to some extent, mental or spiritual uh, challenging, our response should be on the same level. It's not only an intellectual response. And here I completely agree that instead of uh, inside our communities abroad and in Israel and between the communities, this should be our main challenge, not trying to fight others and convince that we're fine or that we look nice and that we don't need to, to not harm anyone, to not say a word that might bug someone and then they might turn against us. No. Instead of trying to somehow, um, I don't know, prove others that we have a right to exist, we need to build ourselves as a strong community and we have a real challenge. Yes, the relationships between Jews globally and especially Jews in Israel and the Jews outside of Israel are is, is an immense challenge that is not dealt with enough that is not um, presented enough as the challenge that actually jeopardizes our future or might become a springboard to a completely different reaction to these uh, phenomena that we're, we're talking about today yeah I agree I, I was saying to some colleagues the other day that I think in the United Kingdom the community, the left, the right, the religious, the secular, they came together to fight the threat of Corbyn. And they really unified and they stood up in a way that was unprecedented, yeah. I think, in British history. And now the divisions in the United States in the Jewish yeah. community among the left and the right and the religious and the secular is very serious. And I just hope, I hope, and I think the jury is out, that the American Jewish community unites together to fight the anti-Semitism in the United States, in on the right and on the left, and stand, have the courage and the the, the sensibility to stand with Israel. And it's uh, the next few years will be a serious challenge to the American Jewish community, and I think to the Jewish people and Israel all over the world. So, this is what I said. That to some extent, we're chosen again against yeah. our will, maybe. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, yeah. As Bob Dylan said, we're born here and we're, we'll die here against our will. We, we're born against our will and we die against our will. Anyway, 
All right, yeah, Ellie, but, but, it was great to see you. And thank you very much for, you your, for, for your time and effort to join us and for your insights and wisdom. And I hope you have great success in all the projects you're doing in, the, in Haifa on anti-Semitism and that the program that you're building, the, it's the first master's program that it uh, mm -hmm. goes from strength to strength. And uh, you'll be the beacon of light uh, for all of us here in the in Galut, in the, in the yeah, uh, yeah, academic yeah. world. So we all, we should, we should all. Pardon? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for the venue and good luck. And uh, I really wish that uh, everyone would leave this uh, talk with at least this one idea that we have this uh, unique uh, message of unity that we hours. need to develop. And this is um, to some extent the way to build our future. Uh, amen. Thank you, Ellie. And to everybody, Monday, and Ellie, I hope you'll come. Uh, uh, Natan Sharansky will be here on Monday at 11 a.m. New York time, uh, 6 p.m. in Israel. So I hope everybody will join us. And in the meanwhile, everybody stay safe and healthy, and uh, see you here next week. And Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Important. Bye. Take care. Be well.